Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. I hope you have a great day planned. I plan, Lord willing, to go to an actual movie theater this afternoon and watch a World War I uh, movie. And tonight, I'm going to hopefully at our house watch an episode of the show called The Chosen, which is um, stories from the gospel with my family. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I'm going to take a break from Philippians this morning because sometimes a passage or chapter of the Bible kind of just rocks me and takes a hold of me and I want to put everything else on hold so that I can talk about that. And that's what I want to do this morning. Because what I've been noticing over the last few weeks and over the last few months is that I have felt fear creeping back into my life. And perhaps you can relate with your own battle with fear. And, and my fear, I can always put my finger on it to some extent. And right now, it's, it's family fear or fear for my family in a variety of areas that I could talk on for a long time. And I've noticed that this creeping fear is a place I've been before. I remember going to speak to a, a godly man one time, and I was just talking to him about all my issues and problems. And he said, I hear a lot of fear. When was the last time you weren't afraid? That's a good question. When was the last time you weren't afraid? Fear is something that can just take hold and grip, and sometimes we don't even pay attention to it. But if I ask you, when's the last time you've been afraid? You're like, well, it's been a long time. And as I was thinking about creeping fear into my life, I'm sure it's been trying to set up shop in your life and rule the day in your mind and your emotions and your heart and your life. And I thought, well, you know, today's a good morning to take a break from Philippians. And we're going to try to combat this creeping fear with the truth of God's Word by looking at Psalm 56. We just had that read here. Psalm 56, just to set a little context for you, is a psalm written by King David and his situation has gone from bad to worse. He is fleeing Saul, King Saul, who wants him dead. So he's being boxed in and he leaves the the protection of Israel and he goes over to God's enemies in Gath. Gath is the hometown of David's first big enemy, Goliath. You know things are desperate when you start going over to the enemy territory, right? So he shows up in Gath, and and guess what he has with him? I did this in family worship last night. I asked my kids, guess what he has with him? And someone said, Goliath's head. No, he doesn't have Goliath's head with him, but close. He has Goliath's sword with him. Can you imagine? That's not a good look. That's even worse than showing up at a Chicago Bears football game in a Green Bay Packers jersey. This is not a good look for David. It, his situation has gone from bad to worse. It reminds me of the time my eyes were hurting so bad that I needed to put drops in them. And instead of putting eye drops in my eyes, I put ear drops in my eye. My eyes were already hurting, and now they were on fire. And I've accidentally done this twice. (laughs) We have a lot of situations that go from bad to worse, and we've experienced this in our country as we were dealing with the virus, which was bad enough, and then the unrest of the last few weeks have doubled the pain, and even in your own life, on a personal level, you can say life has been hard at times, but then there's double dose of pain. It hits and it makes your life go from bad to worse. And when things go from bad to worse, it can stir up a lot of fear and despair. That's why we're looking at Psalm 56 this morning. Because it shows us that this fear doesn't have to stay there, but we can turn it over to the Lord. So this morning as we go through this chapter, we're going to see a great example of a combination of things. Trial and yet trust pressure, and yet praise, darkness, and yet walking in light. You're like, well, how can all those go together? But that that describes life, doesn't it? And that's what we're going to see in the psalm. So let's go ahead and jump in. Psalm 56, verse 1. 
Be gracious to me, O God. Be gracious to me, O God. Many of our prayers can start with this desperation that simply says, help. David's coming to the Lord and he's saying, help. I need your graciousness and your mercy. Help me. It's a good place to start. Be gracious to me, O God. For man has trampled upon me. Fighting all day long, he oppresses me. My foes have trampled upon me all day long, for there are many who fight proudly against me. Notice that the enemies have trampled upon me in verse 1. And in verse 2, they have trampled upon me all day long. His enemies are consistently applying pressure and pursuing David to bring him down. They are relentless. They are not giving up. They are ready to swallow him up. And then it's not just one or two, but it's many who fight proudly against me. So these enemies have taken the high place and they're trying to lower the boom on David. David is helpless. David is weak. David is limited. David is inadequate. David is weak. And David is in just the right spot to be. Why would I say that David's in a good spot right here? Because of what J.I. Packer has said. He says, weakness is is the way now why would weakness be the way weakness is the way what does that even mean we see weakness means that when other people view you as weak and you view yourself as weak so at this moment right now david is viewed as weak limited inadequate and he feels weak, limited, and inadequate. And he's at just the right spot. But I don't know about you. I don't like to feel weak, limited, and inadequate. In fact, I certainly don't want you to view me as weak and limited and inadequate. But it's the place to be because weakness is the way. And, and Paul put it like this when he said in 2 Corinthians 12, he said, when I am weak, then I am strong. Well, how does that work? How does that work when I'm weak, I'm strong? What what do you mean? What Paul means is that when I'm weak, then I have Christ's power perfected in me, which means God's grace is sufficient for me, which means we get to a point that God is all we got and God is all we need. And when we get to that point, when others see us that way, we see ourselves that way, that's a good place to be. And watch what it makes David do. Verse 3, he expresses it this way. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I have put my trust. I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? So things of God from bad to worse. David's at the lowest he can go. And he says, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. Biblical counselor, I really appreciate Ed Welch, and he says in this situation, you have a merger of fear and faith, and it shows up in the same sentence where on one hand he feels fear, but that is combined with faith. Now don't assume that just because you feel fear, you're going to combine it with faith, because there's a lot of things that you can combine fear with. You can combine fear with fighting. Get afraid, you want to fight back. You can combine fear with fleeing. You get afraid, you want to run away. You can combine fear with freezing, right? You just frozen, you don't know what to do. But right here, David combines fear and faith and brings them together in a deliberate choice. I'm not talking about what you feel because what you feel, you may feel like you want to run away, you want to fight, you want to freeze, but you can make a deliberate choice to exercise faith in God where you can get to a place like David where he's pretty much saying when I am afraid I shall not be afraid (laughs) when I am afraid I shall not be afraid and you go what changes and it's that concept of trust 
He completely relies upon the Lord and he throws his whole weight and life upon the Lord. And he's so confident, he says at the end of verse 4, what can mere man do to me? If I ask you what do you fear the most, many of you would say that you fear people. You fear their opinions. You fear man. You fear women, what they will do to you. And so David asks this question, what can people do to me? What can mere man do to me? And some of you may want to answer that question. Excuse me, David. They can kill you. That's what they can do to you. And yet Jesus says in Matthew 10, 28, He says, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him as able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And for those of us who are in Christ, knowing that we're not going to face hell, we're not going to face wrath, but we're going to get acceptance in heaven, ultimately there's nothing man can do to us that's of consequence ultimately there's nothing that your circumstance can do to you of consequence ultimately there's nothing that despair and things that are trying to be thrown in your way can do to you of confidence because you are safe in the lord jesus christ what can mere man do to me nothing so in the midst of the trial He has trust. But what about pressure? The pressure is on. He's feeling the intensity. Look at verse 5. All day long they distort my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They attack. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited to take my life. Because of wickedness, wickedness, cast them forth. And anger put down the peoples, O God. Now, this attack on David is brutal and it's unrelenting because it lasts all day long. His enemies are distorting his words all day long. Their thoughts are evil against him all the time and they're watching closely to kill him. These Philistines want him dead. And yet, as the king, the rightful king, David has the right to ask God to bring his wrath upon those enemies and all the people who oppose him. And as I was looking at this language of five and, and six, I, it, it kind of reminds me of this language could be easily described Satan's attack on us. You know, Satan targets you all day long. His thoughts are constantly against you for evil. He desires to attack and to take you out. But like David, we can say Satan is a defeated foe because of the cross of Jesus. And Satan's doom is sure because Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire and tormented forever and ever. And even though we have an enemy of our souls, that enemy will not ultimately win. But the pressure can feel intense and it can cause a variety of motions. That's where verse 8 comes into play. David says, You have taken account of my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? David is a fugitive. He's running for his life. And he says that God has taken account of my wanderings. But for those of you who have the ESV translation, it says, you have kept count of my tossings. Huh, that's interesting. Makes me think about someone tossing back and forth in bed, unable to sleep. It reminds me, years ago, I had a sleep study. Any of you ever had a sleep study? You know what this is like. You go in there and they hook you up with every wire possible. All over your head and all over your body. And they're monitoring you all night and trying to see how you sleep or how you lack sleep. And they got all these readouts and printouts and they're watching you every second. And to think that God takes note of you even at night in your tossings, even in your anxious and troubled tossings, that God sees you and God cares. In fact, the language here is beautiful that says that God cares for you so much that He capture your tears. Did you see that there? He captures your tears 
in his bottle and records them in his book. You know what this means? This means that God has documentation of your pain and suffering. God has documentation of your pain and suffering. You may have forgot about that time back in 1982 where you're crying your eyes out and God documents that. He saw you. He cares for you. And at night, none of us may be aware that you're on your bed crying and tossing and anxious and God is there documenting your suffering, caring, taking note of it, paying attention to you. And as he documents your suffering, it's for a point. And that point is to do something, to act. Verse 9. Then my enemies will turn back, and the day when I call, this I know that God is for me. David is saying this because in his mind it's a done deal, that his prayer is going to lead to God's action. And God is responding to David's prayer. It's almost as David said, I'm going to pray this, and God, I just know you're going to act. And thy enemies are going to turn back when I call. And just kind of give you a heads up on what really happened. Do you remember when he went to Gath? And they're like, uh, that's David. He's the guy that chopped off the head of, of Goliath, and he's an enemy. And then remember that? They brought him in. They're like, what's he doing here? Maybe, maybe David thought he could take refuge um, among the Philistines. And what, what, what did David start to do? Remember this? He started to act crazy. And the king of Gath is like, do I not already have enough crazy men here? And for some way, under God's grace, the Lord delivered him, and he was free. It's very interesting that when we suffer, prayer is often our last resort when it should be our first resort. And men, on this Father's Day, I just want to make sure you see this. David is a warrior. David is a man who has led armies and led the nation of Israel. And David is also a man who cried. You see that? God documented his tears, kept them. David is also a man who poured out his heart in desperation to God. That needs to be kind of our first impulse as men. And then women, under desperation, is no matter how messed up we look, is to go to the Lord and pour it out to Him. Because in his time, God will act. And David speaks this confident truth. He speaks this confident truth at the, at the end of verse 9. He says, this I know that God is for me. There's a lot David didn't know. Like how he's going to get out of all this trouble. There's a lot you don't know about your life or your future. But you, this you can know. God is for you. I'm going to do something I don't like doing in my sermons because I don't like when other preachers do it to me, but I'm going to do it to you anyway. Um, I don't want you to say it very loud. You can just say it in a really calm voice, but I want you to repeat after me in a very calm voice, okay? Repeat after me. This I know that God is for me. Well, let's do that again. This I know that God is for me. There is this song called The Blessing. And it's based upon Numbers 20, chapter 6, 24, and 26. It's a, it's a blessing that I used to speak over my kids for many years. Anyway, there's this song called The Blessing. It's about 11 minutes long. And there's a part in this song where they repeat the phrase over and over again. And it says, He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. And when stuff is start piling on you, when suffering comes, you don't know what's going to happen next. You know that He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. This I know that God is for me. I don't know anything else, but I know God's for me. It may feel like God's piling it on. God's about to take you out. That's not true. This I know that God is for me. People may be against me. My circumstances may be messing me up. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but this I know God is for me. You've got to speak the truth of God's Word to yourself. Those of us who are in Christ have God on our side. He did not die in vain. 
Bearing the wrath in our place, buried, rose again, we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And this we know, that God is for us, not against us. Keep it going in your head and in your heart. God is for you. And not only that, look at verse 10. He says, in God, in God, whose word I praise. In the Lord, whose word I praise. In God, I put my trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? So the pressure's on, the pressure's on, the pressure's on, and yet he praises. He expresses praise for God's word because the word of God is is sustaining and life-giving. And I just think about when, when you are afraid, And when your world is starting to crunch in, His Word is the reason why you can trust. Because without the Word of God, you wouldn't know the heart of God and the truth of God. In fact, I would say without the Word of God, in your trial and in your problem, you have no interpretation. You can't make sense of what's going on unless you have the Word of God. It's like you're in a race. I've heard it put this way. It's like you're in a car race. You're in a car race. I've never been in a car race, but apparently if you're in a car race, imagine being in a car race and your enemy somehow takes mud, flings it on your windshield, and you cannot see. You do not see the goal. You do not see where you are going. What do you need to do if you're in a car race and your enemy flings mud on your windshield? It's really simple. You turn on the wipers. So you can see, this is the wipers right here. You got to get in the Word to have some interpretation to see what's going on, what's happening to you. You have to get in the Word to take the wipers and get that mud off so you can see the goal, so you can head toward the prize of Christ Jesus. You got to get in the Word. That's why we say, praise God for the Word. It gives me interpretation to understand what's going on in my pain and my suffering and my fear. I need the Word. His word I praise. I get squeezed. I'm going to praise him because I have an interpretation right here. So we have this trust in the trial. We have this praise and the pressure. And the last one is we want to walk in light in the midst of darkness. Look what he says in the last two verses, 12 and 13. Your vows are binding upon me, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death, indeed my feet from stumbling, so that I may walk before God in the light of the living. David is firm in his commitment to fulfill his vows. He's going to offer the appropriate thank offerings. And he says, you know, I'm going to walk before God in the light of the living. Because the Lord has delivered his soul from death. And you know, at this point, he's like, it's as good as done. It's as if David is saying, God is for me. I'm crying out to him. He's documenting my suffering. I praise him for his word. I know he's going to act. But even in the midst of the darkness, he is going to walk in the light of light. And I think that we could talk in similar terms for those of you who have been delivered in Jesus Christ. You're following Christ. You know Christ what He's done for you, what He continues to do for you, and yet you live in this land of darkness and you go through seasons of darkness. And in the midst of all that, you're going to say, okay, I'm being squeezed. It's dark. I'm going to praise Him. The trial's on. I'm going to trust Him. But here, when the darkness covers your life, you're going to walk in the light of life. You ever heard the phrase that many Christians talk about when they go through the the dark night of the soul? Christians have in turn, throughout the centuries spoken of seasons of life that may seem hopeless and they may even feel like God is distant from them and doesn't care for them. And maybe some of you have gone through those seasons where it just seems so dark. And maybe you're in one of those places right now. As I've heard Christians talk about these dark nights of the soul, one of the things that has discouraged me is when I've heard some of the testimony say, I went through a dark night of the soul for two years, and for two years, I could not pray or read the Bible or go to church. And to that, I want to say, no. Because no matter how dark your life is, no matter how dark your circumstances are, you still have to get to a point where you're not cutting yourself off from light. 
Even if things are dark right now, don't cut yourself off from the Word. Even though things are dark right now, don't cut yourself off from prayer. And even though things may be dark right now, don't cut yourself off from the fellowship of God's people. Because even in the darkness, we want to walk in the light of light. So here we go. Trial comes. You want to trust. The pressure's on. You want to praise. When the darkness closes in, you want to walk in the light of life, knowing that God is for you, not against you. So I'm going to ask you again. When was the last time you haven't felt afraid? And just know that that fear and faith often goes together. And the trial and the trust and the pressure and the praise and the darkness and walking in light because you can know God's got documentation of what's going on in your suffering. He's got it. He sees, he cares, sees the tossings, sees the tears. And he cares. He's not against you. You may think he's trying to take you out. He is for you. If you can't see that clearly, you've got to have a right interpretation. You've got to get the junk off your windshield, get in the Word so you can interpret interpret it rightly you know sometimes when I'm at the lowest of my low and I try to pray to God I'm like God I don't even know what to say and I I keep a journal every day I've been trying to journal for for years and sometimes when things get so dark I don't even know how to journal my prayers so what do you do when things get so bad that you're not even quite sure what to pray for because it's too painful you want to pray And what do you do when it's so bad where you don't even know how to talk about it with someone else? Or when things get so bad, you don't know how to write it down. Here's the words you need when things get so bad. If you're looking for words, the book of Psalms has words for you. These Psalms in this book are meant for you to adopt as your own. When you're out of words to describe your pain and your need, here are your words. So I want to encourage you. Encourage you this week to make Psalm 56 your prayer. Maybe even a prayer that you pray out loud. Adopt this prayer. Make these your words. And may the Word of God become your words back to God. That's what it's there for. And as we go to this time of prayer, we're going to pray this prayer. I'm going to pray it. And I want you to listen. And may your heart and your mind, may this be your prayer. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Be gracious to me, O God, for man has trampled upon me. Fighting all day long, he oppresses me. My foes that trampled upon me all day long, for they are many who fight proudly against me. When I'm afraid, I will put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God, I I have put my trust. I shall not be afraid. What, What can mere man do to me? All day long, they distort my words. All their thoughts are evil against me. They attack. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited to take my life. Because of wickedness, cast them forth and anger. Put down the peoples, O God. You have taken account of my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise. In the Lord whose word I praise. In God, I put my trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Your vows are binding upon me, O God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death, indeed my feet from stumbling, so that I may walk before God in the light of the living.